course, my favorite. Why do, I, why do I think she's my favorite? Because I describe her in my book as Fort Lauderdale's Black Joan of Arc. Because Eula Johnson, who was part of the, uh, she, uh, she was part of the wade-in. She was very keen on getting rid of all the bits and pieces of segregation that she saw in this town. And she was an excellent organizer. Now, if you're going to have uh, demonstrations, peaceable or not, you have to have a good organizer. Uh, it's interesting, she is described as uh, the president of the NAACP. What they forget is that she was the first woman president of the NAACP. You know, words are interesting, aren't they? <laughs> And it's always interesting about women's history, about the ones that get left out. You know that if a woman is going to be a first woman of anything, she's going to carry a lot of credentials and baggage before she gets that position. Uh, it was my, it, it was really a great thrill a couple of years ago uh, when the, um, uh, the 50th anniversary of the wait-in was established in town. There was a big celebration. And part of this, uh, I was one of the few whites floating around in that crowd. Um, Susan Gillis was another. I had my camera. She had her camera. Uh, the rest of the white people were essentially politicians, and most of them were men. And what was interesting was, as she was being described, all of the descriptions of her went on and on and on, and never once was the, the word brave used. What she was doing in the organizing, which was frequently done secretly so that nobody could know what they had in mind, if you did that kind of organizing in other parts of the South, you could get killed. This was very, very serious. The worst, according to what Marilyn said, the first, the only thing that happened to her that way was that one day her car had all of its, all the tires um, were slashed or something. That was it. But that day, her, her grandson, who was with her on the wade-in of the beach, and he was crying at that time. He was about five years old. His grandmother was telling him not to cry. But that gives you the idea of the kind of tension that there was in that situation. Children have a way of showing this like the rest of us adults don't. And he was talking about his grandmother that day um, at that celebration. And my grandmother, she got those telephone calls. Boy, she got those telephone calls. And those telephone calls were nasty, but she never stopped. And then he said, and it just, brought up roars of laughter in the audience. My grandmother sued every single person in town. <laughs> well, that was when, by that time, the federal government had come in, and there was some backing in terms of what they could sue about, which was not true earlier. But she was, she's really more like Rosa Parks, because she was involved with organizing demonstrations about all kinds of companies and stores and so on that refused to hire blacks at that time. So it wasn't just the wait-in. But that day, um, it, it was really a very remarkable day to be there. And I was so pleased that I had the wherewithal to go. And uh, that day was particularly interesting because the NAACP opened the doors of their new place, their new office, and their new office was Eula Johnson's house. Mm -hmm. So telling, and such a touching kind of tribute to her tremendous involvement um, in the desegregation of town. And um, Marilyn's going to say something about this, I know. Um, Actually, uh, the uh, she was uh, she traded off. Uh, the the uh, Dr. Von Weizel was very involved with, with the NAACP, 
and he had been president for a while and then she would be secretary and then they would trade off and she would be president for a while and he would be uh, secretary. Uh, Dr. Mizell had been working on this for a long time, of course. Uh, he had a sort of a different style. He was a fairly wealthy man, came from a wealthy family. Uh, he could more or less talk on some level with the white establishment, you know, that he could. And he basically had a tendency to sort of use uh, threats in a way, rather than actually getting out and doing something, he would say, listen, if you don't do this, then something, we're going to have to maybe integrate the beach or do something like that, you know, if you don't give us what we want. And he was able to get quite a lot done, not as much as he wanted. He never got as much as he asked for, but he would get some. Uh, but uh, Eula Johnson's uh, style was different. She, in the first place, she was doing this a little bit later. Things were changing. Uh, there was the civil rights movement had gone really national. Of course, it always had been national, but it was often done on sort of low key. People were not paying that much attention yeah. to it. Uh, you know, it was keeping it sort of in the background. Uh, whereas uh, now people were going out and they were demonstrating. They were going out there and saying, We don't like this. This has got to change and we've got to do something different. And that's what uh, Eula Johnson was doing. She said, we've got to go out there and we've got to make our presence known. We can't be just invisible. We can't just step back here and hope we can kind of negotiate something. We've got to really go out there and show them that we can do this. And so that's basically what she was doing. Uh, it's interesting, we have a picture, we have several pictures, of course, of the, uh, uh, weighed in and they're quite telling, they're quite interesting. The, you can see the crowds of all the white people that were down there you know, yeah. on the beach. Yeah. You know, and I mean it was a very tense situation. You know, you had all of these people were just sort of crowding around and it was, uh, you know, just these few uh, black people who were uh, African American people who were trying to go to the beach and go for a swim. Uh, there's a picture that I always thought was uh, uh, one of my favorites of Eula Johnson is when she was coming to, um, I believe, to the police department because she was going to, uh, for a trial. She's accompanied by about three or four young men oh, who are all nicely, I think I have it in yeah, there. nicely dressed in their, you know, black suits and uh, yeah. ties. Uh, but it's interesting. She's got this pretty dress on, this uh, sort of sort of a sundress, I guess, yeah, you know, with all white, all white eyelet, you know, eyelet lace uh, sort of thing, <laughs> high heels, and her, her bag and everything, they're very feminine, and then you look at the expression on her face. Well, you look at that face. And you can you tell. You going to mess with that mama. <laughs> she <laughs> is. <laughs> look at that. She is serious. Um, this is what. What was the date? What was the date of that? It would, it would have been 1960, I think it was. About 1960. Um, That's when the when the uh, uh, weigh-ins were happening that summer. I don't have I don't have that they picture. They I don't have that picture dated here. They have uh, the the weigh-ins. Uh, they started July 4th, and as a matter of fact, there were a number of other weigh-ins. There were some serious weigh-ins up in Chicago uh, at the same time, the same date. So it was kind of part of a national movement in some ways. Yeah. And, uh, but then they continued for several, uh, several weekends uh, throughout the summer until finally the county, I think, decided, well, we're just going to declare all of the beaches integrated. And, and that happened sort of at the uh, end of the summer, I think. 